Welcome to the Highland Wonders podcast, where we share stories and knowledge from experts about the charismatic species and diverse ecosystems of the Okanagan Highlands of North Central Washington. My name is Jen Weddle, and I am a co-director of Okanagan Highlands Alliance, a nonprofit conservation organization dedicated to protecting the beautiful Okanagan Highlands the traditional and ancestral lands of the Okanagan First Nations in British Columbia, and the Okanagan, Lakes, and Colville bands who are now part of the Confederated Tribes of the Colville Reservation. It's probably not news to you that corvids, a family of birds that includes crows, ravens, magpies, and jays, are smart. They're tool users and problem solvers, they mimic sounds and appear to play. They live everywhere that people do and lots of places where people don't. Just this winter, I watched two crows taking a bath in the snow, wiggling their bodies into a snowbank and throwing little clouds of white fluff into the air. And a few springs ago, we witnessed a crow, known forever after in our household as the heroic crow, challenged a bald eagle who had picked off an entire brood of ducklings giving the mama duck and her last remaining duckling time to reach the safety of cattails along the edge of a lake. I think everyone probably has a memorable story about a crow or some member of this corvid family, because wherever you live, there they are, doing interesting things. One of the cool things about Dr. John Marsluff is that he wants to hear people's stories. He uses them to look for patterns, to add to his bank of understanding, and he incorporates them into his scientific process. Dr. Marsluff is a professor at the University of Washington's College of the Environment and Forest Sciences, where he studies how humans and birds impact each other and have shaped each other's behaviors and cultures. Originally presented in 2016 at the Community Cultural Center of Tenasket, This presentation followed the publishing of one of Dr. Marsluff's books, titled Gifts of the Crow, How Perception, Emotion, and Thought Allow Smart Birds to Behave Like Humans. If you like what you hear and are interested in learning more, check out the episode notes for links to more resources from Dr. John Marsluff. Enjoy! We've got moons on our shoulders and stars in our eyes. We know just what we're doing and we know it's right. Microphone okay on me? Yep. So I'm supposed to tell you a little bit about myself. I've been outsmarted by ravens everywhere. I've definitely been on the, the wrong end of that <clears throat> deal many times. But I, uh, I've studied crows and jays and ravens for ever since graduate school for me, so 35 years or so of uh, trying to understand these birds a little better and how they interrelate with their environment and how they interrelate with people. And so what I want to tell you about tonight is um, some of the weird things that people have observed them doing, uh, hoping to get some of those same sorts of stories from you all and, uh, and share with you what others have shared with me. But I'm a professor at the University of Washington. I'm in the School of Environmental and Forest Sciences there, which is in a new College of the Environment. It's a fun place to be, you get to work with lots of interesting people, and you'll see some of that collaboration in my talk tonight. So uh, there will be some anatomy, there will be some brain terminology to start off with, but I hope that just gives you a better perspective on what these animals are able to do and how they do it. And then we'll have lots of fun stories, you'll be able to, um, to relax again. But the quiz will be, I guess, right before the break that way. There's a standard relationship between the brain size of animals against the body size of them, uh, where small animals have small brains and big animals have big brains. But there's a lot of scatter around that. And some of it's due to the kind of animal. So for example, fish, they on average have smaller brains than birds, which are smaller than mammals and smaller yet than primates like us and other apes. And even though within a group like the birds, there's a lot of variations. There's a big bird with a small brain, the ostrich. You can think of that bird, probably not the smartest one out there. And then there are other birds like uh, the New Caledonia crow. is very large brain for its body size if it was a typical bird. Much more on the line with mammals 
And some of these, like our American crow that we have here, or the, or the raven, these are up closer to the primate. So really, they're like small flying monkeys as opposed to birds because of the size of their brain relative to their body. It's still a very small brain. It's the size of your thumb. But for their body size, it's big, and that allows them to do some extra things besides just coordinate that body and, and solve their, their typical problems. And so the other birds that are up here are things like the macaws, the big parrots. They also have big brains, and you think of those as being pretty smart birds as well. But all of the corvids, the crows, ravens, jays, magpies, they all have uh, large brains for their body size. And you can rest happy that ours is even well above that. But, but the porpoise is right there. So why, why also would these animals maybe do some of the same things we are able to do with our brain? Not only is it big, but it shares the same architecture that ours does. And that's what I want to tell you a little bit about. And that's because we had a common ancestor that developed a brain. Of all the vertebrates here, the first ancestral vertebrate was a, was a type of amphibian, or fish actually before this, but amphibian on land. And that gave rise to modern amphibians some 350 million years ago. Then as amphibians transitioned to reptiles, that kind of stem reptiles that gave rise to other vertebrates. So it's a mammal-like reptile that gave rise to mammals, including us, uh, long ago. And since mammals evolved, then more modern reptiles and finally birds evolved from dinosaur-like reptiles. So this has been a progression, and all of these vertebrates have the anatomy of the brain in basic shape. There's a brain stem, there's a big hemisphere that we think with our uh, cerebrum, and then there's this cerebellum in the back that hangs down in the back like a grapefruit that coordinates a lot of our actions and movements. And the crows, like us, have a big forebrain. That's what they have that's unique. There's two hemispheres, it's eyes, which are almost as big as the brain. Birds really have huge eyes, although you only see a little piece of them that sticks out of their, their eyelids. But they've got a big eye behind that that's collecting all this information. And then uh, the more primitive part of the brain that's shared with all vertebrates. But this gray matter is different than ours. It's not convoluted on the outside, but it's got similar functions. And it's made of the same tissue, the same nerve cells that do the same things with the same chemicals uh, that communicate in their brain that happens in ours. So the basic way this works, and these will be the terms that will be on the quiz, so you might want to pay attention to those. Uh, as information comes in through nerves, for example, from the eye or the ear, they go to special places. And so the bird's processing all this different sensory information and is trying to make sense of it and use it to, to do something, to command activity. And it does that by forming connections between neurons or nerve cells in different parts of the brain. Maybe up here where visual information is processed, it connects with another part of the brain where uh, vocal or sound information is processed. That might also coordinate with part of the brain that, that is important to emotion. The amygdala of the bird's brain is the same as your amygdala that you have that, that processes your emotional feeling. And memory, the hippocampus of the bird's brain. You have a hippocampus as well that you use to remember things and navigate with. And the bird has one too. And by making connections among all these parts, physical connections between the nerve cells and the chemicals that communicate between those cells, birds can form these kind of emotionally charged and spatially relevant memories that are of various sights and sounds or smells or other kinds of sensory inputs that they get. Just like, just like you do, the same sorts of things. And they can do one other thing we know now Birds and mammals can do this. Reptiles probably to, to some extent. Amphibians, it's not known uh, that they can do this. And that is they can use the information they get and instead of immediately commanding their body to do something, to move their muscles or to talk or whatever, they can think about it. They can consider what they're going to do before they act on it. And so I think I always use this example with you guys sitting here. You're very attentive right now, but you're probably thinking, man, he goes into one more of these anatomy slides, and I'm out of here. I want to learn about crows, not all this brain stuff. But you're not getting up and walking out. But you're considering it. You're rolling it around. <laughs> you might give me one more slide or two, and then, okay, you're up and gone. You send that command down to your muscles. Well, the bird does the same thing. It brings this information in. It processes it in various places. And then it can send the information back down the spinal cord to its muscles to move. Or 
it can reconsider it because it has a connection like we do that allows that same signal, the same, neuro, same electrical signal that stimulates the, the muscles to go back to the brain and re-stimulate that part of the brain that originally thought about it. And they can change it, and that's how they change the vocalizations they make. They have loops, is what they're called in their brain, that allows them to refine and change and modify their song or their planned action and basically learn new things and reconsider those things before they shape it into a final electrical signal that they send down their spinal cord to their muscles to do things, whether it's their voice or whether it's actually moving or, or fluffing their feathers in a particular posture, for example. So we do the same thing, and, and, and so do the crows and ravens, and, and all birds, as far as we know, are able to do this. So that's why they can, I think, do some of these amazing things that people report. Their brain is big, it's able to process information and think about it and shape it to adapt to its environment and, and do these interesting things. So let's look at some of these weird stories that people have, have told me about and, and think about what the bird might be doing in this case. So I don't know if you all have seen ravens do this behavior, but this was seen in uh, Colorado. There are two ravens that are soaring in a, a windstorm or just an updraft along a, a rocky face there. I'm sure you've seen the ravens here in the evening soar along the cliff faces here. But these guys had taken it a step further and they were actually surfing. They were carrying pieces of bark in their feet and using it to ride the wind to get a little extra airfoil on it. I've seen them carry a variety of things, sticks and paper and things like that, but I've never seen them hold it like a surfboard. And why would they do that? I mean, you know ravens are great flyers. They don't need any extra help, really, in flying. Uh, they don't need it for some extra torque to make a twist. They can do anything in the air, really. Maybe they're showing off to each other. Social structure is very important for these birds, and they learn a lot from one another. They show off and demonstrate their dominance, maybe to a mate or to other members of their society. Could be part of that. It could simply be fun. And, it, and it's a very good explanation because we know, again, considering the brain of these birds, brains form of new connections, learning new things by play. In a relaxed situation, when the endorphins in their brain are providing good feeling, they're basically able to relax and, and try these new things out without the threat of punishment for doing it, uh, making a mistake that a predator might grab them or another bird might. So they're, they're working out new circuits in their brain by playing all the time, just like we do. And there's no reason to think that they wouldn't do that for that reason in the long haul, but in the short term, for the reason of doing fun things, releases brain hormones that make you feel good. That's what motivates us to play, the release of those endorphins. And ravens and crows have the exact same chemical coursing through their brains when they do these sorts of things. So maybe you saw there was a video out a few years ago where a hooded crow in Russia got atop of a little container and he walked up on top of this church steeple, this steep, steep roof, sat on it or stood on it and slid down on it. And that was neat. But you thought, well, he's just kind of trying to get some food off it. But then he picked it up and walked back up and did it again. And he finally flew off with it. He wasn't going to leave it there for the next one. They play with other animals. This is a pet crow pulling the string in front of the cat so it would pounce on it. So, so not only do they have a good time, but they can also read the intentions and postures of other species, which would make sense with crows and ravens that often interact with other predators in the wild, wolves or coyotes and things like that. And they understand both, interesting to me in this case, the cat and the bird understand that they're playing and not, not really having a predator-prey interaction here. They can use insight to solve problems. This is an example of that new Caledonia crow. And here the task was to get food out of a tube. They needed a straight long stick to get the uh, food out. And that straight stick was only found in another cage that they needed a small stick that they had to pull up on a string to get the stick, to get that stick to solve that uh, problem. And they let birds become familiar with the different pieces, but not all together. And when they first put birds in then to try this with all those three pieces out together, the average time to solve it was six seconds. <laughs> so they understood the issue right away, what was needed, and, and, and went through the process to get it. They take all sorts of risks in their environment. As uh, my neighbor was driving, actually, he and his son were driving, and this raven was right in front of him in the road, and they drove over it, and they thought, ah, oh, we killed this raven. 
And they looked back, and the raven was right there eating. And they watched the next car come over, and the raven just ducked down. Car went right over it. It continued to eat. And around here, you know, if a raven leaves its food, which they often do, it's a good chance that magpies will be on it before the raven, and they'll get it. Or an eagle might come by and grab it. So being able to find a way to stick with it in this case provides, even though it's risky, it pays off in having access to this food. I don't know if he made it past the third car. <laughs> they do go after predators. Uh, I'm sure you've seen crows and ravens dive bombing at hawks and owls or eagles uh, here. Occasionally, again, that becomes deadly for them. There is a real risk involved, uh, but it pays off most of the time. And what's, what's interesting is it's it's done, obviously, to move predators out of an area in one respect, but it's also, again, done to show off to one another. And the bird that gets the closest and dives at it most vigorously is the dominant individual in the particular area. And there have been experiments done where if you put another crow mount by a predator, for example, the crows that come in to attack the predator, the first thing they do is they attack the other crow. The dominant guy comes in and knocks him off. And in crows and ravens, males are dominant to females. They're a little bit bigger than females. And so they're the ones that you see taking those risks. They are delinquents. They get in all kinds of trouble. Lots of stories of, of the bird that did this or did that, that that we didn't want them to do. And I'm sure you've had some of these experiences if you live with them. But drinking Ravens Brew coffee in Anchorage and Juneau, favorite thing of ravens in the parking lots there, or these India house crows taking cigarettes and and all sorts of things, uh, stealing diamond rings, taking dentures, lots of different items have been stolen from people, and most of them returned, but, but not all of them. In this case, in Japan, the, the jungle crows were stealing candles from these shrines, Shinto shrines, which was not a good thing, and for those you all are very sensitive to this, if you take a light, lighted candle and fly off with it and, and drop them in the woods, what happens? Well, they started a lot of fires, and people couldn't figure out how the fires were getting started until they tracked it down to the crows stealing these candles. And these candles are made of a, of a plant fat. And so they're very healthy for the birds to eat. They were a good food item for them to eat. And they'd go in and steal these and, and use them as, as food later. And it got me kind of thinking some of the early Indian legends we have around here in particular of ravens stealing the light or bringing the light to the world could very well have been motivated by similar observations, maybe stealing candlefish, for example, that were lit from early uh, campfires or whatever. They have all kinds of vocalizations, and I have some recordings of some raven vocalizations. I thought I would play some of these for you. We don't know what all the different calls are by any means that ravens or crows do. We know they have some very standard calls, like the, the mobbing call that, that attracts others to come in and move predators away or begging calls when they're hungry and things like that. So I have a few of those here for you. And then I also have one of a raven talking that I want you to hear because they're very good mimics as well. We'll start off with what females do. So females give these rattle or knocking calls. So maybe you've heard calls like this. There's a variety of different ones of them, different numbers of knocks, they're longer rattles, but typically those kind of calls are given by females. Uh, mated pairs will duet back and forth and you'll hear the male deeper and the female um, higher pitched. So they'll go on and on for hours like that. When birds are around food and they can't get at it, they're hungry. They'll give these yell calls, very commonly heard. Those will drive you crazy if, you, if you've got a brood of young around all summer. This one is, a, this will be a fast call, but it's interesting. It sounds kind of like a crane to me, and it's a, a warning. Basically, if a, another raven hears this, there's going to be a fight if they don't back off. So very, uh, very specific uh, meaning in that particular case. If, if you don't listen to this, I'm going to attack. And then a lot of the calls they give are territorial. All those are territorial advertisements. Okay, and now for the talking. So what you're going to hear in this is you're going to hear a woman, Mrs. Hurlbut. She has a pet raven, 
And they sound, the raven sounds a lot like her because when you raise a raven with a person, they take on that particular voice. So he will ask questions, she will ask questions. What's your name? What do you know about Edgar Allan Poe? What, what do you call a raven that does bad things? And things like that. So you'll hear her ask a question and then you'll hear the raven answer it. What's your name? Well, maybe you know about Edgar Allan Poe. According to him, what is the raven supposed to say? I've heard the raven steal things. What would you call a bird that did that? So obviously they understand these questions quite well, understand the answers to them, no. They d doesn't understand the answers, but um, certainly has been taught to say certain things in response to these prompts. But sometimes when uh, crows or ravens get away, after they've learned this kind of thing, they then use this voice to do other things. And for example, there was a crow around Missoula, Montana in the 60s that, was, that awoke a, a guy that I've met since then and this, this guy was awakened because his dog was barking in the backyard like crazy, just going on and on and on. And there was this guy calling his dog, here boy, come on boy, here boy, let's go. <laughs> and Kevin got up, he went out in his backyard trying to shut his dog up and get the guy who was calling his dog out of there. And as he went over to the kennel, up popped a crow saying, here boy, come on boy, let's go. <laughs> and this crow was... Famous, he'd go, he went around the neighborhoods and he rounded up all the dogs. <laughs> all that he could get. And he stole them, basically, and brought them to campus here in Missoula, lined them up under the tree and was calling them, here boy, come on boy, let's go. And all the dogs are looking, sure, where do we go? What's next? <laughs> and when there was a break uh, in classes, the crow would take off, all the dogs would be chasing after him, he'd run through the students and... Um, would maybe, we, we, we basically hypothesized, maybe knock loose a french fry or a bag of chips or a sandwich or something and got food this way. But he did it for a few weeks and then was not heard from again. <clears throat> maybe he's stolen dogs elsewhere or he got caught by a dog at, at this point, we don't know. But it was an interesting behavior and it's not an unusual case. I've got probably 20 examples where people around the world have emailed and said, yeah, I was a kid and I got called back to the house. By, by our pet crow sounding just like my mother, you know, saying, Tommy, come home, or whatever. So this is, this is an interesting, to me, use of this skill that they've got, this language, that they understand the meaning of, or at least the response they get from it, and they do it on their own time, basically, to either have fun or to score a meal or to, to just mess with the people that are in the area. <laughs> What I want to talk about for a little bit is how these animals have then interacted with us. So they do all kinds of interesting things, but they also have had a long history with us. I argue it's a coevolutionary history where they've basically shaped our cultures and we've helped shape their cultures as well. There's a whole bunch of different things through time of how humans and corvids, crows and ravens in this case, have interacted. So initially, uh, ravens were around before people even evolved. And they were scavenging from predators like the saber-toothed cats or big vultures and condors that were out at that time. And as we came along and started hunting, uh, boy, the crows and ravens glommed right onto us. We were an easy mark. We were pretty messy. We left a lot of things around, and they got right in there and got them. And that probably forced us to be a little more attentive, to cache things, to hide things, to, to defend our foods as well. Not only from predators, but from scavengers like the, the crows and ravens we were evolving with. This led us to things like some of the legends we're familiar with here in the Northwest, like I said, of the raven who created, created the world and, and peopled it for his own amusement. And um, that stimulated lots of interesting um, legends and, and mystery, basically, and how people were having to deal with these animals who would not only motivate them, but also steal their salmon as it was drying on the racks. So lots of kind of plus and minus of these birds all the time through history. They challenge us, but they also motivate us. In Europe, they were heavily involved with scavenging people on early battlefields or after the plague had killed lots of people, for example. Ravens and crows were, were kicked out of towns. They were bounties put on them to get them out because they were seen eating corpses of humans. 
and the plague doctors wore masks that looked just like ravens, and ravens are kept now in the Tower of London as a, as a symbol that the kingdom won't fall as long as those birds are there. In Scandinavian countries, there were ravens that basically informed their gods of, of the state of the earth. And in Asia, they really informed artists quite dramatically. They really appreciated the, the, the flocking and social structure and family structure of these birds and painted it in many different ways. Maybe you've seen this big screen of crows that is uh, at the Seattle Asian Art Museum for a long time. If you visited there, fabulous thing as long as this room basically is of a, of a huge flock of crows from the Edo period. And then on through modern times, motivating our, our films, you know, from Hitchcock's The Birds and how now the, the bad omen of the raven and crow from medieval times is carried forth. And when something bad's going to happen in a film, you hear a, a crow calling in the background or... Uh, we use them to name our, our sports teams after the Baltimore Ravens, for example. And now they're co-evolving with us in the city. And they're learning us and they're reacting to people that are different, good or bad, in those places and discriminating amongst those. And we've done some research on that, which I'll, I'll tell you about. But this co-evolutionary process, we think, is, is basically fed back and forth. And... These animals have culture like we do. It's, they don't, as far as we know, they don't do great paintings or they don't have um, musical scores, but they, they certainly have culture. And, uh, and for an animal, that's a learned behavior that's passed on from one individual to the other. That's one of the key components that I think makes these animals so successful. Not only do they have big brains, but they live a long time, 20, 30 or more years. Uh, during that time, they gather lots of personal information, but by being social, they also gather social information, learning from one another. So those three things together allows them not only to influence us, but also to adapt to us and to pass on what they know about us to others in their group so they can learn to live with us uh, in a more successful way. So people were asking me the kind of difference between crows and ravens and um, to clarify that I kind of use the two interchangeably when I'm talking in general about the group for sure. So let me step back for a sec, and you do have both species here, the American crow, uh, and these guys, you know, are smaller, about, uh, oh, I don't know, 16 inches or so tall. They're typically in groups. They're typically around people. They're rarely found away from people. Um, they will breed in kind of uh, regenerating thick forest, but it's usually within, you know, a half a mile anyway of a picnic ground or, um, or of a town you know, uh, like, like Tenasket. And then ravens are uh, half again as big, so they stand about two feet tall. They have a four-foot wingspan. They're the size of a red-tailed hawk. Uh, much larger bill. They have a wedge-shaped tail. Typically, you only see one or two ravens together, unless you're at a dead animal, where you might see 30 or 40. And these, uh, they have very different social systems, both crows and ravens. Crows tend to live in family groups and defend territories that they're basically on all the time. And uh, they have permanently monogamous pair bonds, so same male and female together for life. Ravens do the same thing, but ravens kick their kids off of the territory after about a month or so, and that's probably because they make all that noise yelling all the time. <laughs> Get them out of there, and then they go on and they, they basically flock up at these rich food sources, whether it's an ag field or a dump or an animal that's been killed. And they are very vagrant for many years until they get a mate and settle down or they find a territory and settle with the, with the animal that's there and then become territorial. Both of them you can notice maybe in the, in the spring as the young are coming out, when the young are begging, you'll see them wave, waving their wings, begging from an adult to get fed and they'll have a pink mouth lining, both crows and ravens. The adults have all black mouth lining. So if you see a bird, he's on your property calling and it's all black inside, that's an adult, probably a territorial pair that, that lives there with you. But the, the crow social system is more of a family group. They allow some of their young to stay for years and help raise other kids that they have. And that kind of depends on the, the environment and how much food is or isn't available. So that's a little bit about the difference between the two. But in general, they have very similar responses to people. Ravens learn how to live with wolves and other things in the wild, and crows really learn how to live with people in the city. And that's what I'll tell you about here with some experiments we did. I know some of you said you have seen the nature program that, that we were a part of. 
uh, several years ago. And so I'll tell you about those experiments. And basically the idea here was that we noticed when we go out and catch our birds or go to their nest to study them, they'd act differently to us in the, in the next time we'd come around. They'd hide from us or they'd, they'd scold or run away. And they just seemed off-putting, uh, basically, by our presence. So we thought they must be recognized in us. And I think anybody who's been around crows and ravens comes to the conclusion pretty quickly. They, they know who you are if you've been good to them or if you've been bad to them, and they will let you know what they think. <laughs> so we thought, well, we would just test it with an easy experiment. When we captured some birds on campus 10 years ago, I wore, and one of my students and I both wore this caveman mask when we caught seven birds. And so as we catch them, we lure them into food, and then we shoot a, um, it sounds like a hunting rifle, it's a 306 blank. It shoots a big net over them and pins them to the ground. So a scary, traumatic thing for these birds. And for other birds that are around, other crows looking at them, it looks like they've been killed. They're stuck under this net and then up come running these cavemen. They grab them out of the net and they're looking at us as we are taking their weights and measuring their wings and putting bands on their legs so that we can tell them apart. Standard kind of research things. But we did it wearing these masks for these birds. And then our idea was we would walk around campus uh, with lots of other people and we would walk around with the mask on and we'd see if they would respond to us when they saw us next. The people would wear the mask. Well, that's a great question. He asked, did the people or the crows respond? Well, they both did. <laughs> we were particularly studying the crow response, but believe me, I should have been studying the human response all along because it was equally, uh, it was amazing. We then, then did this, uh, I'll just tell you about the university experiment, but we've done this in Bellevue and downtown Seattle and all sorts of other places around. And basically, the richer the subdivision, the stronger the response by people to you wearing a mask <laughs> walking around their neighborhood. <laughs> so we don't just wear one mask, we have a control. In this case, we use Dick Cheney as a control. <laughs> And we did this because, as you can see, it's a difficult discriminatory task. And it's also, we, we knew Cheney, if we used him as the bad guy to start, you know, it would be kind of a biased experiment. So the caveman is bad, the Cheney is good. No problem, he, he was neutral to the birds. And what we found is that beforehand, before we did any trapping, whether we didn't wear a mask or wore Cheney or the caveman, we actually wore this hat with it, uh, there was no response. The crows didn't innately hate the caveman. They weren't afraid or or anything about, about us wearing these masks. After trapping, in response to the controls, either no mask or Cheney, again, there wasn't much response. A little bit of an elevated response to the mask, Cheney, even though he, had, he hadn't done anything. But the caveman, the caveman, strong responses to whether we wore it with the hat, without the hat, just the hat, or upside down, they responded very strongly. And the way they responded is that they attacked us and scolded us like they would a hawk or an eagle. They dive down from the trees, they give a harsh vocalization, and they try to move us out of their territory. They follow us and, and harass us, basically. So they could recognize, but what's interesting is that they continue to do this, and they actually increase the amount of recognition over time. So two days ago, when I walked around campus with a caveman mask on, 23% of the birds I encountered scolded me. I have not touched a bird on campus for 10 years. They haven't seen the caveman for a year. So he comes out about once a year in these last four or five years. I did a lot initially, and we saw a rapid increase from uh, you know, no scolding to about 40% of the bird scolding. That was increasing, and now maybe it's decreasing, or maybe this is just an outlier. I don't know. But we'll see with a few more points. But my guess is that it should start declining. They should. Most of the birds that were trapped, there's only two that were trapped that are still even alive on campus. And so almost all the birds that respond to us are birds that were not even born when we trapped and that certainly were not personally involved in the trapping. They might have seen it, but most of them learned it during these intermediate years by seeing other birds scold us. And when, when they scold, that attracts other birds in, so they come in and they participate in that mob, and that's how they learn this, this behavior. It's not like they go off and talk offline. Hey, there's this guy. He comes out about once a year. Wait for him. But when they see it, those that respond attract others, and that's how they learn. And we know young actually learn from their parents' action in this way, and so do these unrelated individuals. And again, this is advantage of being social, and this is also an example of a culture developing in a, in a bird, and in this case, it's really a culture of hate 
for this particular guy when he comes out on campus. We also now know from these brain imaging experiments where in the brain this behavior is seated. And it's the exact same place it would be seated in your brain. What we do with these experiments is we, we again, we catch birds uh, like we did with the caveman mask. We keep them on campus for about a month and we feed them wearing a different mask. So we wear one mask, not the caveman, but a different mask when we catch them and a, a unique mask when we take care of them uh, in their cages. So we feed them and clean the cage. And then we can do an experiment. We bring the bird in over to the med center, down right where you'd have your MRI done. And we put him in a room and we let him look out while he's processing some glucose with a radioactive label, while he's metabolizing that sugar. The radioactive label goes to the part of the body needing the most energy, and it stays there. And while they're metabolizing that glucose, we have them look out and see the person who caught them or the person who's been feeding them. And then we can anesthetize the bird, put it in a scanner, like you would if you have had an MRI done, put them in a scanner and determine where that glucose with the radioactive label ended up, what part of the brain it ended up in. When they looked out and saw the threatening face versus looked out and saw nothing in the room, the amygdala of the bird's brain on the right hemisphere was what was most active. That's where most of that glucose ended up. That's the same hemisphere of the same structure in your brain that would be activated if somebody scanned your brain while you were looking at somebody you had learned was dangerous or some situation you had learned was dangerous. In vertebrates, that's the part of the brain that's responsible for learned fears. And crows do it the same way we do. And in another experiment, when a group of birds looked out and saw the person who was taking care of them, the other hemisphere to begin with was activated in a different place, the associative reward center. Not the amygdala, but a different place. And that's the same thing that would have been activated, for example, in Pavlov's dog, when they heard a bell ring that was associated with getting fed. That same part of the brain, expecting some food reward. And these birds had learned just within a couple of weeks of being fed, even in a cage situation, hey, this person's a good deal. They're going to bring me a hard-boiled egg and hamburger and chicken patties every day, I, and I'm ready for it. So that's how they're able to distinguish between things like the, the caveman or a neutral person or a friendly person that feeds them, which a lot of people do in the urban setting. How about compassion? We think about the emotional center, the amygdala of, this, of the brain. Uh, we know it's activated for fear. How about compassion? And in this case, maybe some of you have seen, somebody was describing to me before the talk today of ravens gathering around a dead raven, making a lot of noise. And crows do that, you know, to a, to a large extent. How many of you have seen these gatherings or what some people call funerals around crows? A couple of you. So if, if, you, if a bird is killed, they all gather. There's a lot of noise often. Then it's very quiet. Sometimes sticks are involved and other things have been noticed in these. And then the birds leave uh, as quickly kind of as they gathered. And you might suspect that maybe they are paying respects to a, to a lost friend or a mate. They could have been mated to this individual for 30 years. And there would be an emotional response, you would think, to a loss like that, like, like when we mourn. It could be that they're just sussing out a open territory, taking advantage of a situation. Hey, who's gone? I'm going to take that spot. Or it could be that they're learning about danger uh, and learning that this is a reliable cue that something bad happened here, and I better be alert to what it might be and learn from this activity. So if that's the case, we might expect different parts of the brain to be activated. And we did this experiment. We didn't do it with an individual that the crow in our test knew. But what we did is we held a stuffed crow in a dead posture. We did it with a face, wearing a face that they had never seen before. So what they were getting at, you're, just, you're in the cage now like a crow looking out and seeing this stimulus. And basically the question is, are you perhaps learning that this is a dangerous person or a dangerous place? You know, by seeing that. Or are you mourning the loss of a crow? Or are you thinking about a social opportunity? And if you're thinking about a social opportunity, kind of the mid part of the brain would be active. If it's an emotional, that amygdala should be active. And if it's a learning event, maybe the hippocampus would be active. So what we found is that it was the hippocampus that was activated in this setting, which is suggested there at least one of the functions of gathering around a dead crow, one that you don't know, is that uh, you're learning about a dangerous situation. They're probably learning that person. And in fact, I've had now a student has been studying this in the field, and she's demonstrated that indeed, the birds do learn that person. Because after they've seen a person holding a dead crow in the wild, 
If you come back to that place as that person wearing that mask again, they will respond negatively to you, even though you didn't do anything to those individuals. You were just in proximity to this dead animal. All right, so one other aspect of these birds I want to tell you about, and um, this will set you up for wanting to have these birds come to your feeder at, at your house and interact with them. And that is sometimes they give gifts. And I want to tell you a story about Gary Clark, who approached me in 2006, and he said that he really likes crows. He feeds them at his house. He, I mean, he goes through really great lengths to take care of his birds. He makes them pizza. He puts out chicken. <laughs> Most of my grad students would be happy to go live in Gary's backyard. <laughs> and uh, he said, one day I went out to feed him, and I, and I said to the birds who were gathered, he goes, I, I give you something every day. Why don't you give me something? And that afternoon on his feeding tray was this candy conversation heart with the word love on it. <clears throat> so, you know, a scientist gets that email and he's thinking, I hope this guy doesn't know where I live. <laughs> but I, I followed up with Gary and asked him more about it, and he showed me the hearts. He showed me the other things that crows had left in his feeder, like a stick, a pine cone, uh, some cement uh, buttons, an iron butterfly, and uh, little bits of, of things unusual. And they always showed up after the crows had been in his feeder. So we went there and we thought, well, we could come up with a variety of hypotheses. We'll use the scientific method. You know, what could be motivating this? Maybe the crows understood everything Gary said and we're, we're talking back to him. I figured somebody had pulled his chain, you know, <laughs> or he was pulling ours. Or it was a weird crow, just happened to have, you know, like the talking crow, happened to have lived with somebody and learned these things. Uh, or it could have been real, but it was a mistake. You know, they wouldn't do this purposefully. Or maybe it was some adaptive behavior to try to get Gary to keep the chicken coming. So we could go there and try to rule out these. So let's just go through. And I, what I want you to take home from this is that if you see something weird that crows are doing around you or ravens, try to use this approach. Think of alternatives and try to weed them out, basically. And don't be afraid to tell somebody like myself or some other scientist or somebody in a, a bird watching group, this is what I saw. You'll never believe this because they probably will believe it and they, they would certainly like to know and check it out. So, first hypothesis. Somebody's pulling Gary's chain. Well, probably not. His backyard is fenced. His wife's handicapped, and so she couldn't even get out to where the feeder was. Um, he doesn't have kids there. There's really nothing going on, and I figured it's probably not the neighbors anyway, because as you might imagine, if you put chicken and pizza in your yard every day, you get a lot of crows. He gets like 100 crows that comes into his yard, and his neighbors are not real happy with that. His neighbors would not have put the word love in his feeder <laughs> after that. So um, we can rule that hypothesis out. There's something going on there. Maybe it was a squirrel. There were squirrels back there, or, or it was the crows. Well, we get the idea that it's crows because we start getting corroborative information, the same sorts of story from other people. I was on the radio, and a woman called in uh, from Indiana and said that a crow just happened to land on her lap while she was sitting out in her porch and gave her a wooden bead out of nowhere. She had no relationship with this bird. All of a sudden, it just did this. Gail got a red and white rocket. Leona, glass in her feeder, kind of like Gary was getting. Eric, in Cuna, Idaho, he puts mice out on a barrel in his barn, and the magpies leave him shiny things afterwards. And Beth in Seattle, she was throwing kibble and saw a key dropped by these crows. She picked up this key and it started a brand new Mercedes Benz. <laughs> she, she drives this car to this day. It's fabulous. No, no, she didn't get a car out of the deal, but she saw the bird with the, with the trinket. And that was, pretty, that was great for us to see that evidence. And since then, we've gotten lots of other stories. A woman who's got a whole collection of things, including a blue Cap'n Crunch figurine, which she has kept for 15 years, the crows gave her. And maybe you saw on the internet this little kid in Seattle came to my office with a collection of about 300 items, which she's categorized all out, that the crows have brought her uh, at her house. And her neighbors, they, their neighbors don't like them either. <laughs> but uh, it's fascinating the sorts of things that, that people get. And it's not everybody in every place. It seems like from what we've seen on video that it's younger birds that do this. Maybe they are just playing around with things and leaving them. But it would also be a pretty good adaptive strategy. And I really had no idea that this could possibly, I would even entertain this possibility when I first heard from Gary. 
But the more and more cases I hear of this, the more likely I think this may very well be. And especially since in some cases it looks like it's some sort of a social bonding, whether it's to not necessarily anticipating the getting food back, but trying to make a bond with this animal, a human in our case. So for example, my thesis advisor's um, wife rescued a crow that was stuck in their fence, was stuck by its foot in a slat fence. And since that time, a crow would bring her gifts, things like chewed up baby birds or mice. You know, not really, not, not gifts like you might like to get, but the same things they would use to court another individual crow. So forming this social bond in their social species, that's important. Some of that may be what's going on with the person who's providing the food. However, they can also make very sophisticated decisions. So I want to tell you about an experiment that was done just a couple years ago after we had reported these sorts of gifting things. And this was done in Austria. And basically what's going on here, the experimenter's got her hands out, and in one hand she has a rock, in the other hand she has food. And there are crows and ravens in a series of cages that look out at her and have to first grab the rock, take it back in their cage, and then give her the rock. And if they do that exchange, they get the food. So they learn how to do that, and they do it right away. No problem learning. I, if I do this, I get the food. They also know the quality of the food and who's getting what. So if they, they use um, cheese, which the birds really like, and grapes, which they don't like so much. And they will work a lot harder for cheese than grapes, much faster turnaround. And then what was very interesting is that if the bird next to them is getting cheese and they're offered grapes, they don't work. If the bird next to them doesn't have to do the rock exchange and just gets the food, they don't work. So they, they're very sensitive to the quality of the reward and who's getting what in this situation, which is basically all you need to do with the gifting to get food to keep coming also in the wild. So I really don't think it's out of line. We don't have any real proof that it is, but it's certainly a viable hypothesis that uh, they could be doing this as a strategy. So let me just end with some thoughts about these birds. Um, you guys live in, a, in an area where these animals can become pests and challenging for you if you're a, a rancher or a, a fruit grower, for example. You might have lots of crows in your products and, and it can be a problem, or even gardeners have a problem with these, or just the noise, or some people are just freaked out by, oh, there's all these you know, omens of, of bad luck around me. And um, it can be a challenging situation. But what I'd like to leave you with is the idea that these animals have co-evolved with us, they have done it in a way that's very similar between us. We use the same parts of our brain to make these associations between one another, and that allows us to form these kind of deep mental connections with these animals. And it's not like that with all animals. Domestics, yes, but not so many wild animals can you have this kind of a mental connection with, and I think that's, that's interesting. And then they also watch us and think very carefully about us, and they use that connection with us to, to get their way in our environment and survive with us, basically. And not many animals can do that. And so they are very, very careful in how they live with us, thinking about us, and figuring out how to do that. And that's what I would ask for us to do with them. Think very carefully about how we interact with them. Are we providing food where we shouldn't? Are we, do we have a dump next to a sage grouse lek where these birds would then congregate and maybe affect sage grouse, for example? Think about that and how we could change our use of the environment, which I know you guys are very much into. Think about what we can do in the, on the environmental scale to stop those sorts of challenges that we might have, rather than what the typical response is, let's just kill these birds. Uh, let's get rid of them. We don't, they're, they're a nuisance, and the easiest thing is to kill them. It doesn't really work because there's lots of them and they come right back to that area. It's much better to have animals there that are kind of behaving as we would like and that have learned to live with us and, and we've learned to live with them. It's a more sustainable strategy. Whether it's ravens and crows or wolves, it's the same sort of thing really, basically training us and them to, to live and parse out the environment in a, in a sustainable way. So thinking about like a crow would think about it, I think would be helpful. And with that, I would thank you for your attention tonight. I am glad to answer any questions you've got on other aspects of crows or jays or magpies. If you want to get any of the um, research behind this, it's obviously some of it in, in these books, but you could also Google the Avian Conservation Lab at the UW, and you'll get our website there where there's 
scientific articles and things like that you could get. So thank you very much for your attention and really any questions, fire away. As requested and true to form, the Highland Wonders audience asked a series of great questions about the ecology and life history of corvids. And Dr. Marsluff responded both thoroughly and with exceptional eloquence. And so, for the next 10 minutes, please enjoy diving yet deeper into the lives of crows and ravens. Ravens live at the heights of Everest to the depths of Death Valley. So they can go anywhere all the time. The ravens nest on cliffs, just like raptors. Uh, they like an overhang above their nest site, though. So if it's a, like a pocket that's in there, a blast out of a basalt cliff, they'll be right in there. Or they'll nest in trees. And in trees, they're typically about a third of the way up from the bottom. So the first several whirls of branches, they're up there. And it's a big hawk-sized nest. The raven mother, well, if you had to line it up with all the other corvids, they probably are the worst mothers, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah, because they, they really kick the kids out of the territory after about a month. They care for them. I mean, they work very hard at raising these young. And, um, but then they kick them out. They have to molt their feathers and regrow those. The adults do each year. So they can't be spending all this energy gathering food for their young while they're also spending the energy to regrow their feathers. It's a, it's a big constraint. And um, they kick their young out. And their young, their young do fine. They go and fend for themselves and, and make it on their own. But they don't have a strong connection with those young like, like crows or magpies do, which you know, tend to incorporate them in the, in the group. Do they raise more than one family in a year? Not typically, no. It's almost always one, especially ravens. Crow, they will re-nest if they fail. If their young die early, they would re-nest, or if their nest fails, they'll re-nest, but not two broods in one year. Crows and ravens would have four eggs, typically uh, fledged two to three young, but it can go all the way up to six or seven young. So like if you're really feeding them, they'll, they'll fledge six or seven young uh, from one nest. And magpies a little bit more. Magpies are more like four to six. So it, it differs a bit, but depends on how much food they get, what kind of quality territory they have. A lot of things we eat crow, big, big raptors, owls, raccoons, bald eagles, all those things are predators on crows. So, so why, do they, why do crows take the risk of attacking a big predator like an owl? Well, it has been shown that the species that do that, because not all birds do that, you know, chickadees do it, some woodpeckers and nuthatches do it, and crows do it, so mostly permanent residents, jays also. And so they benefit by moving that predator out uh, of the area where they're going to spend the night or have their nest. They also benefit at the immediate time because the predator's not dumb. It knows the game's up. I've been found. I can't hunt here because a lot of them hunt by surprise. So they, they, they leave because it's not profitable to hunt anymore. And then the other thing they get is they are showing off to their other flock members. And they're showing that they're, um, they've got the agility to do this move or they've got the, you know, the guts to do it, basically. Crows and ravens are predators. They definitely eat a lot of songbird eggs and young. Maybe a raven might take a young owl, a screech owl, maybe. They'll kill small squirrels, they'll kill snakes, they'll kill birds. They will work together to flush birds into obstacles to, to pick them off. Ravens will cooperate to kill baby seals. Not around here, but you know, where they're seals. <laughs> so yeah, they are, they are serious predators and they work as a group. You know, the pair typically works as a group, so they can take things that are bigger than you might expect. The primary unit of all corvids, magpies, whatever, jays, is the mated pair, and those are long-term, permanently monogamous pair bonds, and that's the, that's the building block of all corvid societies. And in ravens, that's about as far as it goes, is that pair bond, and they defend a territory, but their young flock up at food sources that are ephemeral, you know, like a dead cow or, a, or a, a roadkill deer or something. And they'll get maybe 50 or 60 birds there, most of which are birds that don't have a territory yet. They might be from one to two or three years old, floating around, wandering, we call it, until they find these great food sources. And they'll interact there. Maybe they'll pick up a, 
a potential mate there. They'll hang around for a few years together. Maybe they'll get a territory, or maybe they'll just keep swapping for several years until they land on a, a place that they can defend and have a mate at. Crows, on the other hand, they defend a territory, and it's the pair, but they allow some of their young in some years to remain with them and help defend that territory. Around here, it's usually just one young at about half of the territories. So there'll be trios and, and pairs. And it's usually a young male that stays because he can't compete well probably in the, in the society, so he stays at home. And then in the east, that can build up to pretty large family groups, like five to seven crows in a family group that defend this territory, and it's several generations of young that are with their parents. They also interact with other relatives that they come into contact with. Crows, we know, do this. We don't know about it for ravens. I kind of doubt they would, but crows do, and they might go you know, and visit the, the grandmother or something, or grandfather. At roost, we don't know what kind of organization occurs when thousands collect, but some of this visiting might occur there. We know they, they do interact in other places. They tend to basically be closely related around that same territory. There's a lot of structure with the Crow Society that we just don't know because you'd have to have all the individuals banded and know their history. And there's really extremes in the corvids, like uh, magpies are a little bigger family groups, gray jays even a little bigger permanent family groups. And then there's things like pinion jays that live in flocks of several hundred individuals in the southwest. And these are all family groups. They're like a troop of baboons with a pair and all their young that all live together in this flock. They all know each other. In all cases, they recognize each other by their voice and probably by, their, by seeing them, but certainly by their voice. So they can have very complex societies. They're highly dominant structured, you know, with, again, males, a very linear hierarchy of males from a top male down to a bottom, and females kind of take some of the rank of their mate, but they're always below the, the males in those those species that have, it's been well worked out in anyway. So um, in the mornings and evenings, they always congregate as they're going to or leaving from their roost. Ravens roost in smaller groups of 100 or so, crows up to thousands. We have a roost of 15,000 in Seattle by our place that they come to every night. And as they come to that, they gather in bigger and bigger groups along the way. So you might be seeing some things like that. But they also, you could definitely see that if they're all foraging on a, a kill, for example, they will then all flush up together, they'll hang out there, and as they've eaten their fill in the morning, they'll tend to disperse out a bit. Or it could be a favorite soaring cliff, like those birds in Colorado. There's cliffs where there's always nice updrafts, and birds will congregate there in the afternoon, and they'll all, you know, 20 or so will soar together every evening. You know, they are, they are very gregarious, crows especially. So if there's a crow here, there's others going to go check out, hey, is there something I can learn here, something I can get in on here? Population of crows and ravens, they're both increasing, especially in the western United States. In the east, crows were hit pretty hard by West Nile virus. That knocked them down. Um, ravens are not very abundant in the east anyway. But in the western U.S., as... Cities have grown and suburbs have sprawled, crow populations have skyrocketed, and ravens have increased as garbage dumps and roads and all of our sorts of transformation of the landscape has provided more food. And also we provide a lot of artificial nesting sites for them out where they wouldn't normally be able to nest, like out in sagebrush or tundra uh, with a lot of the oil um, exploration in those areas, provides places for ravens to nest. And they, they can tolerate the climate Corvids are not going to have a big problem with climate change. They're going to embrace it. And it's, it's more their populations are allowing them to spread more places, what I would guess. Do Washington's crows migrate and where do they go? We've um, studied it indirectly. We banded a lot of crows. And some of the crows that we banded end up, I catch them typically in the winter for our imaging experiments because I don't want to catch them while they're breeding. So we catch birds in the winter, band them, let them go back out in the wild. And some of those birds have been found 500 miles north up in Canada. So I do think there are, well, I know there are some crows from Canada that come south. That's becoming much less common with climate change and with urbanization. They're starting to stay further and further north. But we do get an influx. Now, you guys over here, I, I was surprised that I learned today that there are crows here in the wintertime. I would guess most of those birds would have gone to the coast or they'd 
again, here they may be going into cities or agricultural areas where they can get food year round. It's not the, it's not the cold that's a problem, it's the lack of food typically. So when they are really dependent on corn and other annual crops, they migrate from those places because the food's gone in the winter. And some of them may stay in towns, but some we know come here. But our birds that are here year round, or that are here in the summer, they also are here year round. They don't migrate further south, they stay. It's just these winter northern birds that come in. After listening to this talk, I have been looking at the crows, ravens, and magpies that I see every day with new eyes. If you feel the same way and are interested in learning how to connect more with these birds, Dr. Marslove has some ideas for us. Insert goofy face emoji. Depends on what you want to put in your feeder. The best thing is put a dead cow in your yard. You're going to definitely get them. Or a deer. You could go with a deer if you want to start small. But um, they'll come into suet. Uh, and there's uh, Bern uh, Heinrich describes some interesting puzzle that a woman told him about a suet feeder that they started, the ravens would open it, they figured out how to open the suet feeder and take the whole thing out at once, which <laughs> you can imagine that gets old. So she started wiring it with twist ties. I think it went up to 13 twist ties. She had to put on it, it would just undo each one, <laughs> undo it and take off. So they will eat a lot of food. Yeah. And you know, really with all these. As interesting it is, is to have those connections, you know, with crows and ravens, I would say, um, it's really important. And that is, um, we, we can influence their population by doing this sort of thing. And you don't really want to just have a smorgasbord for crows and ravens every day. Because that pair will lay more eggs if you do that, and their young will survive better, and their population will increase. And they do have effects on other parts of the ecosystem. So what I suggest people do, if they want to do that, is do it kind of boom or bust, which is how they normally find food. So you could put a big bonanza out. They'll come in, they'll interact. It'll be really neat to watch for a while. Then they're gone. Wait a month or so, do it again. You know, kind of interact with them like, like they would normally have to interact with food and nature. And that way you're not influencing their reproduction uh, so much and the other birds that are around your place as much. All right, thank you again. is produced by Okanagan Highlands Alliance. OHA is based in Tenasket, a town in the heart of the Okanagan Valley of North Central Washington. We are inspired by the beauty and diversity of the landscape that surrounds us, from the aspen and conifer forests, to the highland lakes, to the tumbling creeks that descend to the wide, glacier-carved Okanagan River Valley. We engage in environmental advocacy habitat restoration, and educational activities in our efforts to protect local ecosystems for future generations. To learn more about OHA or to become a member, please visit our website, okanaganhighlands.org. Thanks to Dr. John Marsluff for the fascinating and entertaining presentation. We hope you are inspired to go outside make observations, and think about your local corvids and other wildlife in new ways. Our theme song, Blessed Unrest, is written and performed by Tyler Graves and Andy Kingham. You can support the artists by finding and downloading the full song from your favorite music platform. Blessed unrest. Blessed unrest. Blessed unrest.